Welcome to the All Things Nintendo podcast. I'm Brian Shea from Game Informer, and this is a weekly podcast to discuss all the biggest news and games from the world of Nintendo. For the last two and a half decades, Ash Ketchum has been the star of the Pokemon anime. However, late last year, it was announced that he would be stepping away from the role as protagonist. If you're like me, that was a massive end of an era but probably not nearly as much as it was for my guest on this episode. Joining me to chat about the anime's long run to this point is someone who has a very familiar voice if you happen to be a Pokemon fan. For the last 17 years, she has played the role of Ash Ketchum on the Pokemon animated series. It's Sarah Natacheni. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm so good. Thank you for having me, Brian. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy you were able to join me, especially since uh, we are recording this a little bit ahead of time. This episode is actually hitting the exact same day that the final episode with Ash and Pikachu airs in Japan. Oh my goodness. Oh, with I didn't know that. Total serendipity, by the way. I was just like, oh, this is the, the, the perfect time for like to schedule this in. And then I looked at like when the final episode's airing and I was like, oh my God, it's the exact day that we are airing this episode. So oh my God. <laughs> it is such a perfect timing for you to join the show. And it's such an honor to talk to you. I've been watching the Pokemon animated series since before you were even voicing it, but like keeping up with it over the years and- it's such an iconic voice, such a great role, and you've done such an amazing job with it. Thank you And we're going to so talk much. all about that, but we have kind of a rite of passage when you come on All Things Nintendo for the first time, and that is getting to know you through the lens of Nintendo, because it's a Nintendo-focused podcast. Uh, so we have a, a segment called First Nintendo Game, Favorite Nintendo Game. Okay. So I will ask you the first part of that question, which is pretty self-explanatory. What is kind of your first experience with Nintendo, your first memory, your first formative moment with Nintendo? So I was never allowed to play video games as a kid, and I went to a normal elementary school where everybody was getting Game Boys, and I was like, I need that. So <laughs> I begged and begged and begged my parents to get me a Game Boy, and they finally, I think it was my 10th birthday or 11th birthday, I don't remember, they got me a Game Boy, a big yellow honker. And of course you need games. And they were like, these games are really expensive. So you get to pick two or maybe even one at, at first. So my first one was, should I, can I answer this question right now? Can I go on or do you want to like it. separate? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I got a uh, super Mario brothers and that was like the, the best time of my life. Like you don't even understand, like, cause I'd never played video games before. I thought this was incredible. And it was a tiny little screen. If you remember, like there was no color, it wasn't Game Boy Color yet. It was regular Game Boy. So it was just, it, it, it didn't look like today's games. Let's just put no. it that way. <laughs> and I uh, had the time of my life. And uh, then I think my mom bought Tetris. And that was when I lost my Game Boy because she became obsessed with Tetris. So I never, basically never saw it again. My mom still has that Game Boy. She still plays Tetris to this day. What is it, like 20, 20 years later? 25, 20, almost 25 years later? Yeah, 25 years later? Holy 35. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My math I, I mean, is it's, it's, I, it's I, I choose to be since... bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say 10 years ago. We'll say 10 years ago. And, like, it's um, like that meme yeah. of like, the 90s always is like perpetually like 10, 10 years, years ago. ago. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, God, Tetris on Game Boy was such a phenomenon. And it was one yeah. of those games that just like took over people's minds. Like you've heard the phrase Tetris Effect, I'm sure. There's a game called Tetris Effect, but it was like yeah. where you close your eyes, you can still see the you blocks see falling. Totally. I had that with like Guitar Hero later on in life as well, where it was yeah. like, Oh my God, like I just was, if I wasn't playing Guitar Hero or if I wasn't playing Tetris, I would be thinking about playing Guitar Hero or playing yeah. Tetris. And it's just wild how that was. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so was it like Super Mario Land or Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins? Do you happen to remember no. which one it was? No, I feel like it was, in my mind, the original, but perhaps <laughs> not. No, we still I have mean, that cartridge somewhere, but the Tetris lives in that Game Boy, so I don't even know where to find the Super Mario. <laughs> so that transitions us to the second part of this question, which yeah. is your favorite Nintendo game of all time. The Super Mario. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's just like the one-two punch there. Yeah. It's the first and the favorite. The first and the favorite. Tetris is great too, but super, I, I just like going boop, 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 you know, going up. We can see each other. You guys can't see us, but we can see each other. <laughs> I like I like jumping up and collecting a coin. It's my thing. It's very, very satisfying. <laughs> and I know that you got into, I mean, you're the voice of Ash Ketchum, mm -hmm. Ash Ketchum, as well as several other characters on the Pokemon anime. Mm -hmm. But you were really into Pokemon Go for a while there. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that? I, I think I've seen videos of you going around and being like, hey, I'm the voice of Ash and I'm playing Pokemon. Like, uh, like 
<laughs> no, I didn't cool. say to, at that point. I wasn't telling people that I was the voice of Ash. I was just I was just being a random person on the street and enjoying myself in the streets of New York with with the people, and it was awesome. Actually. Did people ever figure it out though on their own, or did they just like? Were they just like, oh, this is a friendly person coming up to play Pokemon Go? Yeah, I was one of multitudes of people doing the same thing. Like, it was such a, an interactive game. It, literally, people made friendships, lifelong friendships over this game. So <sighs> I don't think anybody really thought anything of it. And also, I, I didn't have the kind of reach that I have now. So there was no really recognizing me at that point. It was 2016. So, so prior to getting the role of Ash... What was your experience like with Pokemon? Did you have like any like affinity for the games or the cards or the anime itself? So the games I was not allowed to play. The cards mm. I got one pack, and my I don't know where that pack is now. I'm pretty sure my mom threw it away. Oh no! Uh huh. <laughs> I actually uh, I I I mentioned it to her a couple of days ago because she's going through some some of our old stuff right now, and I'm like, yeah, if you find those Pokemon cards, that would be great. Um. Uh, the show I watched, the show I was allowed to watch at that point in my life, a as a younger child, I was barely allowed to touch TV. I wasn't allowed to watch Sesame Street for some reason. Like, it is weird. Um, and Pokemon, I was allowed to watch, and I loved the show, and I loved the movies. And um, yeah, and then I booked it. I mean, I was, what, like 11 years old when it came out, and I was 18 years old when I got the job, so. And how did that opportunity come across your, your desk? Like, you were mm -hmm. like you know, 18. And yeah. you, I believe you started the actually started the role when you were 19. Like, how did that yeah. come about? And like, how daunting was that to step into this role? It was it was like half a year after I finished high school. I, I so I started acting and pursuing acting. I started acting when I was 12. Um, and I went to school for four years. And then when I was 16, I started pursuing representation and, you know, trying to get into the business like in a real way and started doing short films and stuff like that. And um, I got representation and they sent me on this audition. I just happened to be able to audition for it because I was, you know, I'd been doing it for a while. And I happened to book it. It's it was luck. I didn't I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the producers. It's it's a weird one because oftentimes you book something because of you know relationships that are already established. But this this game this game this show I was just it was just being prepared and and being lucky. Do you remember what the audition was like? Like, were you going in trying mm -hmm. to do like a uh, like a, a an imitation of the voice that pre existed with Ash, yeah. or did you kind of make it your own? Yeah, they they wanted me to voice match, so uh, I walked in. <laughs> it's a funny story, actually. The audition was on a Monday, and um, I had that at a, I had a big desk, and I had a an at a glance calendar, and you have to flip the page every week, mm -hmm. and I hadn't flipped the page until that Monday morning, and I looked at the calendar, I'm like, oh my god, no, oh my god, the biggest audition of my life at that point. Um, I'd been auditioning for TV and stuff, but this was like Pokemon. Are you kidding? So um, I ran, I, they wanted a voice match, so I had to practice this, like really practice it. I ran to my best friend's house at the time, and she's not an actor. She, 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 her, she, she, she's not somebody, she's not very musical. Let's just put it that way. And, um, she was like, you don't sound anything like this person. You're never going to get this job. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so supportive. <laughs> Thanks. Useless. <laughs> cool. Uh, so I run to the audition and I didn't realize that it was a dub. I'd never heard of that before. I'd never, nobody teaches that at that point. Nobody taught that at all. Yeah. So, oh my God, my, <laughs> my uh, little, what's it called? My Roomba is, is out there knocking on my door. Stuff. It's ramming into my door right now. <laughs> Uh, is it bothersome? Should I? No, no, kill it's it? great. Okay. It's fine. It's great. You love. You it, like the Roomba. It's awesome. I was actually hoping this would happen. <laughs> yeah, this episode is actually sponsored by Roomba. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gotta cut that. Anyway, um, so I walk into the audition. I don't know what a dub is, and they put me in a booth. It's a it's a director, a producer, all studio people. I don't none none of the Pokemon producers were there. Um, so they're sitting on the other side of the glass. I'm in this booth. I'm in a booth for the second time in my life I'd done like a medical narration before that and um there's a screen in front of me with the show going and then there's a piece of paper with the script on it and I realize I have to be looking in two places at once because the way dubbing works is you have to match what's going on on screen so the voice was right obviously 
It wasn't obvious to me then, but it was right, because they kept me there for half an hour trying to teach me how to dub to see if I could pick it up quickly, you know? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So some people it takes longer, some people pick it up really quickly. Other things I don't pick up quickly at all. Let's get it straight. <laughs> so um, I picked it up, but I it, it didn't occur to me that this was a good thing, and I left that audition just bawling and kicking myself for not being prepared and how could I forget and like this was such a traumatic experience I've never had an audition like that I don't think since um yeah and then I I, I, I there must have been a callback situation but I I don't really remember but then I got it yeah I got I got the call that they want to book you next week and I'm like what do you mean wow <laughs> And when you came in, was it still like a voice match situation or was it kind of like, yeah. OK, so you still didn't have a real chance to like make it your own right off the bat. But like no. clearly you did have a little bit of that opportunity going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people think of you as just like the default voice of Ash now. I mean, you've been doing Aww. it for 17 years and it's it's just wild to to think of almost anybody else in that role at this point. Like, <laughs> just thank you. Because you've been doing it for so long. But yeah. There's actually like you, you touched on this with your audition, but there's a really excellent video that you did with Vanity Fair about three years ago mm -hmm. that shows kind of the intensive process of taking the Japanese version and even just a scene and dubbing it in English. And you, you mentioned like you have to match like the, the mouth flapping and you have mm -hmm. to like sometimes it even involves like taking what the script you were given and being like, oh, that was too short of like a, a, a sentence for the, the mouths and we need to match it up. And you're actually involving with your director, mm -hmm. right, rewriting the scene or at least adding some extra context just so it it matches in. Am I missing any like key parts to that aside from like they can like do like digital elongating and other other parts like that? Yeah, so they try not to do elongating and truncating too much because there there could be some oh god, what's it like distortion? This exactly, yes, uh, distortion. Um, so we try to just try to match it perfectly. We do another take if it can be done a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. Um, we do do that, but uh, sometimes if it's if it's screaming, if it's if it can be done digitally, they do it. Yeah. And you, you get so animated. And I mean, I, I, I love that. Like it's, it's a scene where you're running on the beach or you're running, like, Ash is running on the beach. Yeah. So you're like pantomiming running to like get that out of breath mm -hmm. feel and like the bouncing voice that you would get if you were actually running mm -hmm. and God it, and you're talking about like how you have to like look at when Ash is gritting his teeth or mm -hmm. when he's like really emoting. And so mm -hmm. you'd have to emote. That's so fascinating. I, I highly recommend anybody who's listening to this and has an interest in this topic to go check out that Vanity Fair uh, video from March 2020. It was just so fascinating to watch that. But Thank how you. long would you say that like the process of recording a full episode's worth of scenes takes? Um, for for me personally, I I do an episode like in it depends how many lines you have. So mm -hmm. two, two to four. Uh, well, actually, no. Lately, it's been more two to six or eight hours. Two to eight hours, I think, is the answer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And you're just, are you just in the booth continually? How often do you get like breaks? Are you able to kind of step no. away? No, no, no. They're very kind. We step away. I step away anytime I need to. If I'm like, oh, I'm kind of tired. If there's a lot of screaming going on, then I take a break because honestly, if you don't take a break, you could throw out your voice and then you can't work. So that's not good for anybody. Um, I, I don't record for more than four hours at a time and that's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's, uh, for audiobooks, you can go to eight hours. I've, I, I very, very rarely do audiobooks. I just don't want to be in a booth that long, honestly. <laughs> um, but yeah, four hours max for animation. And, uh, I take breaks whenever I want. I forget what this, what like the SAG regulation is, but there's a SAG regulation every hour and a half or so you're supposed to take a break, something like that. Whatever. We take it when we need them and it's fine. <laughs> And in addition to Ash, you actually uh -huh. provide voices for several other characters, including his mom, Delia, mm -hmm. and several Pokemon. Yeah. Like, what is the process like for finding the voices of Pokemon? So I play 21 of the Pokemon, and <laughs> it is a great joy. It is, it's a lot of fun making sure that no two Pokemon sound alike or have the same personalities. The personality thing is easy because they do all have very distinct personalities. Um, the voice thing, I'm like, Argh! out of voices here <laughs> uh so it's it's been great to stretch that way um the process varies so some pokemon you watch the japanese and you're like that's perfect let's just do exactly that some you look at them and and the name changes in english so you're mm -hmm. like oh this 
could be more fun to do in a different in a different way and so then we just play with various various voices and and it's really fun you just you just kind of and kind of figure it out <laughs> what's the most fun one to voice uh for me it's Baneri. oh yeah just like, kind of like that sweet like mm-hmm. loving cuddly buddy <laughs> yeah yeah Baneri's is really versatile Baneri, Baneri goes really high and really low and falls in love and Baneri is real cute it's my favorite yeah. and uh kind of like how much input do you have in finding the voice for these Pokemon? Because I, I, I imagine that like the Pokemon company has kind of directives for like what it would want these characters to sound like, or, I mean, their personalities are kind of predefined by the script and everything, but mm-hmm. like, do you get to like have free reign of that? Or is there ever time like where you do like a, a Pokemon voice for the first time? And they're like, ah, oh, we kind of want it to sound like this. You know, no, I have, there's actually a ton of freedom for voice actors in, in creating Pokemon voices. It's not something I really thought about, but yeah, no, we're, we're pretty much, I mean, they have to approve it, but I've never, I, it, they've never not approved a Pokemon that I've done. So that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's really yeah. awesome actually, yeah. because like, you would think that like because like the the roster of Pokemon has grown to be so massive, we're over a thousand Pokemon now, mm-hmm. that they would kind of be like, all right, well we we know in our minds what we want this Pokemon to sound like, and it's great to hear that you kind of have had the freedom to yeah. define what so many of these creatures, twenty one of them, mm-hmm. sound like to the multitudes of people who you know that's the sound they hear when they want to when they play pokemon or they think about pokemon yeah. they think about the the voices said in the anime not necessarily the digitized growls that you get in the game right, which right, right. i'm still waiting for them to add those to the game personally because i think that'd be so much fun to have It'd all the fun. pokemon saying their names or I having know. the uh, voice acting yeah um kind of all these years later you know you've been in this this gig for 17 years does it catch you off guard still to this day how important and universally recognized of a character Ash is? It started hitting me in 2021 when I started doing a lot of conventions. I've done maybe 10 conventions over the course of my entire career. Oh my God. And then, yeah. And then like in 2021, I started working with a wonderful agent who was like, let's just have you do these. Like, go for it. Why not? The shows want you. Let's go. I was like, really? Okay, cool. And I started doing them like once or twice a month. And now I'm really, uh, it's especially now since the news came out that Ash is not continuing with the show. It's been just tears, man. We're just crying. I'm crying with strangers. <laughs> it's really, it's really touching and heartwarming. And to hear people's stories of how Pokemon has helped them get through dark times and through illness and and inspired them to be the best, the very best, like no one ever was. Like, that's just, it's it's the, the greatest joy of having this job now. I never, I've never derived this much joy from this job. And, and now just, meeting people, it's, yeah. It's so amazing to see the, the outpouring of love from the community when mm-hmm. this news came out. And it was almost one of those things of like, it took him for granted and now he's leaving and now we're going to miss our favorite character that we all grew up with. Cause yeah. you know, I think you and I are about the same age. I just yeah. turned 36. So uh-huh. um, I, I think really... we're, we're around the same age here. Yeah. So like, this is a character that I grew up with. Like it yeah. was, it is such an end of an era for me. Mm-hmm. And I, mean, I can't even imagine what it is for you, <laughs> but like you're seeing now that you're going to these conventions, all of these, all of these people are just like they have such fond memories of this character and his adventure and you know you're not anywhere near a small part of that you're a massive part of that and your your performance absolutely brings him to life and uh, I guess just overall how has the community reaction to this news been for you both like online and in person um online has been interesting to see there hasn't been like a save ash catch him movement that i was like is there gonna be a save ash catch him movement um just there, in our hearts and just in our hearts um it's it's it, and i and I'm, I'm glad that there isn't that because i really don't want like an uproar over this i want i want there to be positivity surrounding it i like the fact that we're seeing an animated series go through a change like this because in real life we do experience loss and we do experience change and to to have that happen on such a mass scale on something that's so nostalgic and and you know kind of made for children but adults still watch it um it's 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 going to be really nice to see us collectively go through a, a loss like that and a change like that and then come out on the other side experiencing something new and something even potentially more beautiful i don't know what the show is going to be you know um so i'm glad it's i'm glad it's happening we have 25 years of ash ketchum going through 
a, 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 a generation's time, a 25 years. How long is a generation? Is that 13 years? Uh, it's something like that. I, I think it's know. like 13 like, years. It's like 13 to 18, somewhere in there. All right. So like two generations worth <laughs> of time. We have 25 years of Ash Ketchum. I think... Um, I think he's always going to be there for people. I think people are always going to go back and watch the show from the very beginning and experience Ash and share it with their kids and share it with their kids' kids. And um, he'll always be there, you know? So, yeah. and Especially now that, like, all the seasons or most of the seasons are on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Like, that's such an accessible thing. Whereas before, yeah. it was like, I was buying the DVDs, which I don't mm-hmm. really buy DVDs anymore. It's all about the streaming and, like, digital purchases now. But, yeah. like, for the Pokemon anime for the longest time I was just buying up DVDs as they were becoming available on Amazon. And like, that was how I was like kind of recapturing that feeling of watching that show back in the day. Yeah. And speaking of which, like you're talking about like how, like this is a show that is like kind of giving people this generation wide, like sense of loss with this character stepping Mm -hmm. away. But like the Pokemon anime has always been notable for me because it is like just this fun adventure with friends and like Mm -hmm. these these creatures that don't exist in the real world. But like at the end of the day, it is so heartfelt and there are some moments and this is before your time, but like back in like the early days, I think this is the first season. Maybe Mm -hmm. I remember that it was the first time maybe ever that a TV show made me cry. Oh, and it me was too, when, possibly, yeah. When Butterfree yeah. was leaving and they showed like the flashback <laughs> set to the Pokemon theme song. And I was like, oh my God, Aww. like to this day, that will make me choke up a little bit. And then I like when, when Brock and Misty went like their separate ways the first time, like yeah. when they were all like go- going off on their own adventures, like that was another one. It still hits me in the heart. Yeah. And that's what I think is so great about the Pokemon anime is that like, it is like a fun adventure. It's silly a lot of the time, but like, it gives you those heartfelt moments that yeah. you don't get in a lot of other, especially like shows geared towards children or mm-hmm. like a family audience. Totally. Totally. I and know. like, I, I, I would think like the biggest thing for that is like your performance brings that to life in a lot of ways. And with that, like it allows you to kind of flex your, your voice acting muscles. Mm-hmm. And like, do you remember a scene or like a, an episode that really stuck out with you as like something that you're going to remember that session for the rest of your life? Oh man. Yeah. There's, there's an episode where um, a Pokemon dies. Do you remember this? I think so. I think I know the one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. I like, should I, I, I'm always afraid of saying what it is. Cause I don't want to ruin it for anybody who's listening to the show is who this, hasn't seen it yet. Is this the one from several years ago? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. we're probably okay. I'm, yeah. I'm not fully caught up on the new season. Exactly. Uh, like honest, I don't want. So I, I don't want. If there was anything in that, but if it's a few a few years old, I think we're we're okay. I don't want to mess it up for you or anybody. Anyway, a Pokemon <laughs> dies, and and Ash has some really heartfelt moments, and he has a fight with um with another character, and and he has to get over. It. It's just such an emotional episode, and it's an episode that uh, my director Lisa and Ortiz and I kind of we had to step back and cry. We were like, this is this is a lot. And Lisa had just lost her cat and I had just lost my cat. They passed away. And um, it inspired us to literally start advocating for animal fostering. Like this, ep- this episode was the seed that needed to mm-hmm. be planted for us to be like, we need to do something. So out of that, Voices for Fosters was born. And we I started fostering. I fostered like 100 cats and kittens out of that. And and now I, I just raise money for um for animal rescuers that's awesome that's a one of the most noble things you can do honestly like is just taking care of these animals that don't really have a place unfortunately yeah and that's why i'm always on the side of of adopt not shop so totally i'm definitely with you on that uh, how many foster fails did you have i have to ask uh zero really you were able to foster hundreds of cats and kittens and Mm -hmm. not be like i need to keep you i almost (laughs) failed twice Bennett, beautiful Bennett. Bennett was really hard to adopt out because he was very anxious, like extraordinarily anxious, but he was very, very beautiful. And um, I found a, a woman who who came to my apartment. A stranger came to my apartment <laughs> and like sat on my bed and tried to bond with this cat. And I'm like, it wasn't happening, but I saw I saw a glimmer of hope. And I'm like, please, you got to come back tomorrow. Just come back one more time and see what happens. And she came back the next day. Bennett was all over her. And I'm like, there it is. That's it. And I cried and she was like, oh, my God, I found my baby. And uh, they are very, they're still very happy together, I'm happy to say. 
Did it ever get easier to say? I know we're talking about Pokemon mostly, but like this is I'm very this fascinated is very by this. parallel. <laughs> <laughs> Did it ever get like easier to say goodbye to these cats as you fostered them and then saw them off to their forever homes? Yes, and that was the point. So when my cat passed away, I'd had I'd had her since I was like 11 years old. So she mm. was like my baby, and I was like, "There's no way that there's a better cat out there. She's amazing," and. As she was dying, I was like, "There has to, I have to be wrong about that. There's, there's no way that's true." So I'm like, "I'm gonna foster. I'm gonna meet. I'm gonna meet a bunch. I'm gonna date. I'm gonna meet a bunch <laughs> of cats." <laughs> and uh, that proved to me that every cat is different. It's they're like Pokemon. They're very different in personality and appearance and powers, and um, they are all wonderful in their own way. And it's just, it's just a matter of of matching your personality to your pet's personality. Mm. So. So speaking yeah. of uh, kind of matching personalities, was there ever a Pokemon that you hoped Ash would catch? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. Um, matching per this is a two this is a two pronged question. It is <laughs> because we need to match his personality. But it also has to be an awesome Pokemon, also has to be right? An awesome Pokemon. And it has to be something he hasn't caught. So you're going to catch me in like, wait a second, has he caught that one? <laughs> I've been on this show a long time, right? It's it's a lot of muddled stuff in here, okay? 17 years. He, he 17 says goodbye years of... and hello to a lot of Pokemon. Yeah. At Do you have an finally... answer for this question? I feel like you have an answer for For me, this it was question. always yeah. Dragonite for the longest time. Okay. And I was so one. happy when he finally did get a Dragonite. Yeah, he did but, get one. So this is, no, it's the wrong answer. But <laughs> that was for like 20 years I was wanting Dragonite. Dragonite's my favorite Pokemon. Really? So that's the main reason. But like, it wasn't really a personality thing. It's just like, you know, he's super powerful. And yeah. he also is just like this big, goofy looking anime dragon. That hey, like excuse is, me. Ash, Ash is not the, goofy looking. I'm not saying Ash, I'm saying Dragonite. <laughs> <laughs> Dragonite if we're matching big... here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on, go on. I'm listening. But yeah, so I, I always wanted him to have a Dragonite, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm just super glad that he did, and it ultimately led to him having some great success, obviously. Yes, obviously. Okay. Uh, did he ever catch a Charizard? I mean, yeah, early on. He had a, well, he had a Charmander right. yes. all the way through Charizard, all the way through Charizard. and okay. set Charizard loose in the wild, basically. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was also a hard episode. <laughs> yeah. What about Snorlax? Yeah, he had a Snorlax. He had a Snorlax. Yeah, I think that was part of the Orange Isle. Arc. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, Again, I mean, you, you can't this be faulted for these because these were uh, these were prior to you taking over the role, so you can't. Uh, but be... this was when I was watching it. But I honestly, it, ask me about any show that I watched, uh, even t t ten weeks ago, I'll be like, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> um, I do watch a lot of stuff now, and I and I don't finish The Last of Us. I couldn't. I so, you, you have you seen The Last of Us? I am seven episodes deep right now, so I've not seen the last two, I think. Everybody's raving about episode three. So I watched episode one, and then I happened to be in Mexico with a friend of mine who had already seen episode two. I'm like, all right, let's skip episode two. <laughs> let's go straight. This is how I watch TV. It's disgusting. Um, let's skip episode two. It's fine. And just tell me what happened. Okay, great. And episode three we're watching because it's the most beautiful episode in the history of television. So we got to that 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 moment where we find out what's going to happen in the last 15 minutes of the show. Mm -hmm. We looked at each other and we closed the computer, said we don't need to do this to ourselves. And I never finished it. I it get is it. It's gut-wrenching. I know that, what That happens. entire show, really. But <laughs> I'm good. I don't need that drama right now. <laughs> yeah, it is. I can't it's, watch it. it's bleak. Uh, yeah. that, that, I mean, that episode is, is a tearjerker for sure, but mm -hmm. it's also a... Uh, the entire show. I mean, if you've played wreck. The Last of Us games, you know that that entire universe is not in a uh, not in a particularly great place. Devastating. By the way, I the can't. one that the, the the episode I think that has wrecked me. Now we're just talking TV together, which is fine. <laughs> but the episode that I think has wrecked me the most and wreaked the most emotional havoc in my life as an adult yeah. was Black Mirror's. San Junipero episode. Yo, no, don't eat. We can't talk about it. Can't There's talk a certain about it. song that is featured in that episode that is a very upbeat, happy song. Yeah. I think it's a classic from the 80s. And I cannot hear it without getting a little teary eyed. And this oh, is God. four years after that episode aired. I think yeah. four or five episodes. Yeah, four, it was four a or while five ago. years after that episode. All the stuff that they were talking about in the show is reality now. It really is. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of parallels to Black Mirror. I mean, it's like yeah. when South Park, I think a, a few years ago, was like, yeah, we're no longer doing like 
political parody anymore because like we just can't yeah. top real life anymore yeah we're just reporting the news <laughs> exactly <laughs> and they're basically just trying to race the simpsons to try to like predict what is going to happen in the yeah. future because it's all those like simpsons did it memes yeah yeah oh my god i love that so uh, since since you're uh, struggling to come up with like which one you wish that ash would yeah. catch what's your favorite pokemon my favorite pokemon is pikachu Okay. So I know that, that's kind out. of a lame. I feel like it's a lame answer, but it's true. I've really given this some thought, and Pikachu is the best design, the best personality in my mind. In my mind, um, and he's he's my little buddy, and I've even named my cat Pikachu. I love saying it. <laughs> I love. Do you saying ever say it in Pikachu. Ash's voice? Uh, no, I say it in a bad impression of Pikachu's voice. Okay. So I'm like Pikachu, Pika, Pika, Pikachu. I think you're discounting yourself a little bit that's a very good impression thank you so much i mean if i were when you, you hear though, something would... too much it's just like you don't even know what it is anymore <laughs> it's you not know how it... you like you say a word over and over again it loses all meaning that's yes. kind of how pikachu is for me <laughs> <laughs> See, if i were you though i would be like calling pikachu out in ash's voice constantly no, like no no <laughs> i guess you don't work mix it or mix work and pleasure right? work and pleasure no no he's yeah, my that... boy he's my cat <laughs> he would be really I, he's actually very disturbed when i do voiceover work so i i, I he doesn't come into my space when i'm doing voice especially when he was a baby i would do voices to him and he would look at me like i'm nuts and run away <laughs> it's very funny but it was like very when, offensive <laughs> it's like when cats react to people who are wearing masks it's like yes who are you like just get that off your head yeah i have some videos of me like being like, oh, Pikachu, Pika. And he's like freaking out, <laughs> runs away, gives me this like wide eyed glare. His ears go back. It's really funny. Cats but are very fun to mess with, like cat. within yeah. reason, obviously. But, I don't want to traumatize my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I've stopped doing it since, but whenever I'm in the studio, he's like, he's not having it. He runs away. <laughs> so, are there ever any Pokemon names? Because there are just so many and they're getting mm -hmm. kind of more and more complicated in some ways. Sometimes. Are there any names that you kind of just always struggled with or tripped over or had to like say multiple times to get it right oh my goodness uh evil tall evil tall which is it, it nobody it's very knows tough. <laughs> yeah that's one that pops into mind rayquaza i mm -hmm. don't I, I i never i never had trouble with it but every so many people so many people say rayquaza wrong <laughs> i know i say rayquaza <laughs> wrong wrong you're all wrong <laughs> well it took me so long to like remap some of these these names in my brain like i, I used to say thanos when i was just reading the comics oh uh, yeah sure. and then I, I see the mcu movies and i'm like oh it's thanos, thanos. okay yeah. so and then i had to rewire my brain for that it's like a real yeah. gif gif situation yeah we still don't know but it's graphics why would it be gif <laughs> why would it be exactly. gif it's gif exactly it's gif it should it's be gif but why is it never? Why is it sometimes like I have people in tech who are saying GIF, and I'm like, well, the Holy. creator came out one time and said it's GIF. It's GIF, yeah. Which is nah. very, very weird. No, no, I think this was all for publicity. This is <laughs> silliness, for, silliness. For GIF publicity. They, GIF they really publicity. needed it. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough people are using GIFs. So, so guy, yeah, go Ivatol on. is a weird one for me because I, I, I know that you actually speak Russian. I always want to say mm -hmm. it with like an Eastern European accent, like Ivatol. <laughs> uh -huh. Like I don't know what it is Evil about that tell. name. It's just like I think it's like the 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 way that the verbs and the the consonants are kind of structured in that yes, that word. The y v. Maybe the y v. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is about and that. The but T a l. Yeah. Yeah. The whole the whole thing seems Slavic. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> You're right. So you know we got to near the end of uh, Ash's run, but mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, this was this was a big moment for me personally. Ash taking home the Alola League championship. Yeah. Did, at that time, did you think that maybe that was the closest he was ever going to come to kind of winning the big one? Uh, no, no. I I thought this was a great big step towards winning the big one. Um, I never thought. So it's it's interesting. I had this really uh, somehow naive perspective on the show. I I truly thought it would never end. The, the Ash Ketchum. I really thought that. I, I never gave it much thought. It was just kind of a given for me. I'm like, no, no, this is what I do forever, no? And that's really strange because as an actor, you never have that. And why would I think that? So um, I was like, yay, this is just another step. He's won before. This is not a big deal. Go on. It never <laughs> occurred to me that this could be like a step towards the end for Ash. Um, but I was very excited. It was actually the same year that I won a Voice Arts Award. And that was a nice little parallel between 
me and the character I play. Well, congratulations mm-hmm. on that, by the way. Oh, thanks. It was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> what was your reaction when you found out that he was going to win the Pokemon League World Championship? I did not know that that was going to happen. I found out with the rest of the world. Really? Yeah. So, like, ev- like, <laughs> what did the like what did the recording session feel like for that? Like, just having this moment of triumph. Well, I recorded it after finding out that not only is he winning, but he's also no longer going to be on the show. So oh, no. that session was probably the most emotional voiceover session I will ever have, probably. Because I, if I do another 17 years as a lead character on a huge show like this, that would be a miracle. And uh, it was a real gift to record that way because I'm crying and playing the happiest my character has ever mm. been. But I'm tearing up and I'm like, I need a moment. And then I'm just like gearing myself up and like, what would Ash Ketchum do? He would be the strongest he could possibly be. Wipe the tears away. Let's go. <laughs> uh, so that was an incredibly... Uh, emotional and um, a beautiful, beautiful session. You know, afterwards we we went out for some good diner food and just <laughs> sat there and patted ourselves on the backs for what we'd done. Oh, well, was it was cool. well deserved. Thanks. <laughs> and so you found out the way everybody else found out. So like you, yeah, <laughs> nobody kind of like gave you a call like, "Hey, heads up, this is happening." They called me, so after the show had aired in Japan and Pokemon announced it, which they'd never done before, and that was my first inkling, like, oh, something's different with this one. I don't know about this. And then I was like, oh, no, wait a second. Is this, is this it? Is this why they're reporting it to the whole world? What's going on? Um, But of course, that, that thought in my mind that I've had my whole life on this show, oh, no, 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 it's not going to happen. He's not going to end. He's, he's, he's fine. Everything's fine. Um, but then they were like, oh, we need to have a meeting, just you and the main cast. And I'm like, okay, okay. But that happened after we found out that he won. So then they called and they said, not only has he won, but also bye-bye. Thank you so much. And it was very kind. It was, it was a lovely phone call. They were very kind about it. Um, and then a couple of days later, that's when the world found out that Ash is no longer continuing. Yeah. What? What has the process been like for you kind of coming to terms with Ash's, like his departure from the series as the protagonist? Um, Well, it started with uh, sadness, great sadness. After the phone call, I kind of walked aimlessly uh, for uh, for several hours through the streets of Astoria where I happened to be during that call. Uh, walked the water, then I couldn't find a cab. The cabs don't go by the water, and it was freezing, and I didn't even feel the cold. My hat was off the whole time, and then I'm like uh, suddenly feeling the cold. I'm like, oh man, I'm stuck here. I had to like traverse a park <laughs> to get to a car because the train is so far away. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a great big sad drama right after that phone call, and then uh. I came home. I mean, it was it was a lot of disbelief and a lot of like, all right, you got to get it together because the fans are going to find out. The whole world is going to find out in a few days. So you got to figure out what you're going to say and and how you're going to say it and uh, how you can do justice to yourself and justice for the fans. And um, I made that video that I that I posted across social media in one day. <laughs> I had to gather up like photos from from the past and. And kind of, you know, tell the story of of my time as the voice of Ash Ketchum. And that I cried all day as I made that video. And I had to record a voiceover, <laughs> like telling the story of it. And I actually have a, a, a film recording of myself doing that voiceover because I wanted to keep myself on on task. I'm like, you can't take forever in the studio. You can't be crying. Just Just do it. So to kind of keep myself accountable, I put a camera in front of myself. <laughs> Um, to record that. And, you know, I, I was crying and my voice was shaky. And then I showed it to my mom and she's like, you, you, you should you, uh, cut out. It sounds like you're crying. It sounds like you're crying. Go re-record it. And I'm like, you know what? It's honest. I'm not going to re-record it. I feel like it's, it's how the world feels. It's how I feel. And I'm keeping it. Sorry. <laughs> and it's also important to show that like, not only is this character important to you and this role is important to you, but yeah. like, people have emotions. Like, I I love that, like, 
we are getting to the point in society where we're normalizing like mm-hmm. mental health and being yeah. able to be emotional and yeah. it's like it's okay if you cry because like we all feel like doing that sometimes right yeah and, and it's like a normal is... emotion to have and a normal thing to do absolutely absolutely i'm glad you kept it in is what, what i'm trying to get thank out you there. <laughs> thank you thank you see that mom if she listens <laughs> <laughs> she's our most happy. loyal subscriber actually <laughs> And I do, I have to say though, like the, the picture that you posted, it's you holding the ash mask. Yeah. My most prized possession. (laughs) The little uh, blurb that you had, like kind of just thanking everybody for like, you know, following along and like Mm -hmm. you talking kind of just like, I like kind of, it's been a a crazy journey or an amazing journey. Yeah. Thank you to everybody. It got me a little choked up as well. Like that was such a a nice message and like having it paired with like you holding the ash mask was just perfect. So 10 out of 10 social media posts. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So as I mentioned, uh, the day this episode airs, Mm -hmm. it's the same day that the final Ash and Pikachu episode airs in Japan. Yeah. So, I'm assuming it'll arrive as I hit my mic. I'm assuming it'll arrive shortly thereafter in the U S yeah. Have you done anything with that final episode yet? Or are you still waiting to get anything? Uh, yes, we have, we have recorded it. You've recorded it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you obviously can't say a whole lot about that. Can't say anything about it. What was that session like for you to, to do that? Uh, more sad, uh, more sadness. Uh, f- so for this one, I recorded this one from home. The The winning episode I, I recorded in the studio, and this one I recorded from home. You know, just kind of turned out the lights. There's still more to do, mm. which is which is nice. So we're still working. Um, the the very end will be will be weird. You know, yeah. It's it's just it's just sad. It's just it's just it's just strange to like have a job your entire adult life. And have it be like this thing that you come back to every week. Every week. I've been doing almost every single week of my life. We take a hiatus like a month or two or so. But uh, we always come back. So it's it's weird to not have it, – it's this kind of like nebulous feeling. And, and all my actor friends are like, yeah, welcome. Welcome to this career. <laughs> so I've been incredibly fortunate. I don't know anybody else in my position who's just had the same job for this long. Um, so, you know, I can't be – sad or mad about it it's just a different experience for me personally i mean it's like it's got to yeah. be down to like uh, people like the voice actors of simpsons or family guy right. or south park that's like those are the ones that have stuck around and the voice yeah. actors in south park are a lot of times the creators of south park so yeah yeah it's it's it, ash has been one of the most like secure jobs in voice acting i feel like yeah. th- that i can even think of like there's yeah. I, on a previous episode we were talking about like video game voice acting mm-hmm. and how like some celebrities were coming in like uh you know i don't know if you played the metal gear solid games but there was a voice actor david Hayter, who mm-hmm. voiced snake through most of the games and then for metal gear solid 5 it was suddenly oh Kiefer sutherland is now voicing snake and like david Hayter was just like out of a job for that Oh, and wow. it was just like, it's a weird thing that like, you know, really no role is safe, but it seemed like Ash was one of those roles that was like, oh yeah, Ash is absolutely eternal and you're going to have that role until yeah. you don't want it anymore, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I never had it. People would ask me like, do you think you'll ever like walk away from this? I'm like, why would I? Even if I have to like go out and do a movie, I, I'd gotten to a point where they're, they were very, fl- very kind and very flexible with scheduling. So like... You know, technically, I can make things happen as I as I needed to, and that's kind of happened in the last few years too, which is kind of sad because I was like, "Yay, okay, all right, now I can like play around a little bit more." But and it's such yeah. a bummer that now is when you started going to all these conventions and really getting that face to face interaction because, like, that's when you really start to feel like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. Like this, it's like rejuvenating when you go to those. I'm imagine totally, totally, because you feel like so voice acting happens in a, in a box, you know, like we're in studios by ourselves, so we don't see all the kids, all the people watching our show and and applauding and loving it and laughing and all that. So. Um, when you go to conventions is the only time as a voice actor when you get to see that. So it's, it's really, it's been really nice to like work during the week and then go and have applause on Saturday and Sunday. And then you go back to work and then next week and you have it again. Um, but I mean, I'm going to keep doing them for a while. I think this year is pretty packed. Um, I think next year there, there have been a lot of amazing requests. I'm very grateful for that. So we're going to have to, you know, do the, do some of those next year because of scheduling conflicts and stuff. Very fortunate. It's really nice. 
Has the door been left open at all for you to continue voicing him in just even a lesser capacity, like not as the protagonist? The door is open. Yeah. That's, That's all awesome. I can say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know yeah. that I probably speak for everyone when I say like, we would love to see Ash back with your voice mm -hmm. coming out of his mouth. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but obviously like this, po this, this conversation has been largely focused on Pokemon, but yeah. your career is so much broader than just Pokemon, even if that's, you know, what a lot of people who are listening to this podcast know you as. Yeah. One thing that stuck out to me when I was looking through your IMDB page, mm -hmm. you had a role that sounded very, very fun in Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yeah. So do you want to tell people what you were in that? <laughs> um, I'm very randomly one of the actors who played the mini puffs in Ghostbusters Afterlife. There was a small group of us in a in our own home studios. Some some of them were in the studio, but it was done. I saw other people over Zoom and um, yeah, it was really fun. It was matching to picture, so they had already animated it. And uh Technically, I've had a scene with Paul Rudd. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yes, technically, technically. Guy but never no, ages. I, he, the guy never ages. It's incredible. He's a beautiful man. An actual vampire. An actual vampire. <laughs> yeah. No, I saw. I saw him in person. I can. I can confirm. This man is twenty years old. <laughs> and he was in one of the the U.S. ads for the Super Nintendo. Did you know about that? I think I did. Maybe. Yeah. If you go like search yeah. like Paul Rudd, Super Nintendo playing with power or something on YouTube, you will see the Paul Rudd <laughs> Super Nintendo ad from like 1992. Oh, my God. And he <gasps> looks almost exactly the same. I think his hair yeah. is long. And that's wow. about it. <laughs> wow. Was this 1992? Was that that was before Clueless? I would imagine so. Probably, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know if they're getting Clueless Paul Rudd in, in those ads. Right. Like he and he doesn't. I don't. Probably Does not. he have any speaking roles? I think he's just like a pretty face in that one. <laughs> okay. You got to start. I hate that expression. You got to start somewhere. People would say that to me when reference to Pokemon. And I'm like, you got to start somewhere. It's, it's the, it's, what are you talking about? It's huge. It's the highest it's, grossing entertainment franchise on the planet. Yeah. Could you not? <laughs> what? You got to start somewhere. You know, they said yeah, that to Robert Downey somewhere. Jr. as he stepped into the Iron Man role. Yeah. You got to start somewhere, man. <laughs> It's a real tough yeah. break for you. Hey, kid stuff. Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Kid stuff. Right. Yeah. I think that's kind of what it is. Yeah. And you also just announced that you're uh, joining the Tokyo Revengers cast, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what, like- you're I thought just... I'd have a break. I didn't have a break. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask. Like, you're just jumping all over the place. Like, you're like, all right, cool. Out of this one role that has consumed 17 years of my life and yeah. right into the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't think this one's going to consume 17 years of my life. But um, it's it's. I'm very grateful for it, obviously. And it's it's nice to do another anime. I I haven't really, I haven't tried to do anime. It's not something that I I've been auditioning very much for. So, um, this happened through people I know. Through it's the same. It's the same studio that does Pokemon. So, um, this one made more sense to get. And um, the casting director is a really good friend of mine. And. Uh, I mean, I, I did happen to be right for the role, to be very clear. You don't just get things because you're friends with people. I auditioned for many of her projects and haven't gotten anything. Um, I just happened to be right for this one. And it's very much me. Like that that role is really, it's 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 my basically my natural voice. That's so, great. Yeah, it's And I mean, cool. it, just like the Stay Puffed uh, Marshmallow or the Mini, mini Puffs. Yeah, also my natural voice, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, you have the experience, obviously, of voicing a character who is pre-animated and dubbing in a voice to match, like, the, the animations and the sounds and the the, yeah. the, the mouth flaps, mm -hmm. as you put it, in the, uh, the Vanity Fair video. Yeah. It's... It, it, that experience obviously has to be something that's very valuable to people looking to bring in somebody to either dub or voice a, an animated character. Yeah, I would say there aren't very many. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I imagine there aren't very, very many people who can just pick up dubbing really quickly. Um, the people who do pick it up really quickly are musically inclined. And I come from a family of musicians. I'm not really a musician. I play piano a little bit and I sing a little bit, but I'm not that great at it. But I do have an incredibly musical ear and I have, you know, excellent rhythm. So that that definitely helped. But dubbing is definitely an acquired skill and it takes a lot of practice. And and even still, even today, I'm like, ah, I'm not matching that flat perfectly. So it's 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 definitely it's it's a it's an interesting skill to have. It's an unusual skill to have. It's an unusual thing to have to put this technical skill together with um, an, what I would call an emotional skill, acting. 
Um, and I think we're one of very few types of actors who have to do that to put this very, very technical skill, this like precise technical skill. On camera requires technical skill as well. Um, and of course, uh, uh, what's it called? Sorry, I'm blanking. Uh, motion capture. Mm. Um, motion capture, performance capture, that requires insane amounts of technical skill. I just started taking classes in that. And the the learning curve is, I would say, considerably higher than in dubbing. Not that it's a competition, but... I can confirm that motion capture is a very, <laughs> very steep yeah. learning curve because yeah. we... So we travel around and do cover stories um, mm. around the world. And we went to Helsinki, Finland... Oh. for Remedy. I don't know if you're familiar with the studio. They make like the Max Payne series or they did cool. make the Max Payne series. Um, Control was their most recent game. Yeah. And we did a cover story on Control back in 2019. And part of their studio is they have a facial capture area with like yes. all the lights and cameras and everything to track all your facial movements. Mm -hmm. Then they have a motion capture studio. And basically as part of our story, we're like, can we suit up and like do a motion capture session with you? And they were like, yeah, let's do it. So cool. my my former coworker and I who were on the trip together, we shot a motion capture session in their like basement studio. What? And like we're like trying like they're like, hey, we want to shoot like the opening cinematic of this game. And like you and her are going to be like the actors. So we had to like do that. And then they ended up not using it, which was very, very disappointing. But then like Aww. we did like some motion capture for like some of like the enemies like which are like these like kind of like zombie-esque like mutated characters so like we're oh, like so holding fun. weapons and like swaying like a zombie would and it was yeah. it was very involved and i was very sweaty by the end of it but it was oh, yeah. uh it's it's not as easy as people might think oh my it's not easy at all <laughs> and the amount of skill that it requires it, it really like the people who i i think are working the most are people who have weapons training, who have fight combat training, who, who what else, what else do they do in game? I don't really play games that much, but whatever else they do in games, they know how to do all that. And they know how to do it really well, look really good doing it. So um, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to that level, but I definitely want to do performance capture as, you know, as more of the ethereal regal characters that don't require a lot of combat. A martial arts background. <laughs> the, a martial arts background, because who are we kidding? I have a rhythmic gymnastics background, but that I was a little while that. ago. I did see that. Junior Olympics, yeah. right? That's right. Thank you so much. Bronze medalist right here. Wow. <laughs> My Very greatest impressive. achievement. <laughs> so we're, we've talked about, like, you know, people kind of, let's just frame it this way. Pie in the sky, what would be your dream either voice acting or acting role like not not saying like stealing it away from anybody who's doing it like like even if you were just invited in for one session you get to voice this character who would the character be something original <laughs> something <laughs> that's never something been done before new. i want something that's never been done before um i am writing a movie a live action <laughs> feature about a voice actor who loses her job after 20 years and uh loses her mind Oh no. So, Hopefully that's, that's not my autobiographical. Dream. Oh goodness, no. But it's it's every time something kind of happens, every time there's a little trigger point in in this in my, you know, journey here, I'm like, what if what if what if I just went nuts? What if I did that? Like what would the fallout be from that? How it would ruin my career, it would ruin, but how? So mm. I'm really fascinated by people who who do things and then and then bounce back, you know. Um I remember in my fifth grade, bio, they, they, they gave us this assignment, write, write a biography on somebody who you admire. And I wrote mine, I was 10 years old. I wrote mine on Robert Downey Jr. And that was- Oh, weird. That, that would yeah, come up again. <laughs> yeah, 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, Robert Downey Jr. was not well. Mm -mm. He, was, he wasn't doing great. And this this guy was like my hero, because I saw, I think he had, I think he was married already to his wife, who's an amazing woman. Um, and I just saw this brilliant actor who struggles so much with so much adversity and m manages to claw his way out of it. And now, I mean, now I should update the biography. Now he's Iron Man. Now he's like doing so incredibly well, incredibly well. What a story, you know? One of the greatest comeback yeah. stories I think Hollywood's ever of seen. Of all time. Yeah. Probably the best, probably the greatest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the, those are the kind of stories I'm really interested in, uh, telling and, and experiencing as an actor. 
So you Even have... though I don't have a comeback story, I never left. So, <laughs> and my life is too boring. You know, it's too boring if it's don't not. Don't call I, it a comeback, right? Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> it's I've been here for years. <laughs> So what else? Like, you know, we have uh, this screenplay that you're writing. We have yeah. Tokyo Revengers. Yep. What else does Sarah Natacheni have going on? Uh, I have a movie that's in the festivals right now. It's called Unicorn Boy. I play the the main unicorn, Prince Purpleton. Um, what a great the, name. Great, great name. Uh, Matt Keel wrote, directed, and animated this whole feature film. An absolute genius. Uh, it's come co-starring with Pat Oswalt, Maria Bamford, Harold Perrineau, and Michelle Trachtenberg. It's about a heartbroken young artist who uh, gets sucked into a unicorn-run alternate dimension. It's beautiful and funny and so original. So or- I've never seen anything like it. Um, so it's doing well. Hopefully it gets wide distribution. We shall see. Um, I'm in a podcast where I'm playing an anarchist, uh, Emma Goldman. Uh, it's called Across from Jericho. It's very cerebral. It's very like if you are into history, go listen to Across from Jericho. Um, that's that. That's my favorite. I've I've never played. I don't think I've ever played a a real life person before. This might be my first time doing that. So it was really fun to kind of go back and learn about Emma Goldman and learn how, what she sounded like. There are very few recordings of her, so I had to had to fully extrapolate her entire essence and being and voice and manner of speaking over over the course of time because she started out with a a much thicker russian accent and then as she spent her life in america kind of it got americanized um so i tried to play that as much as possible um i have a video game called victory bells where i where i speak russian actually i did that years ago and it's just coming out now it's coming out later this month also Um, a, a very interesting that's also a pokemon name victory bell Oh my God, Victory Bell! You're right. <laughs> what are How the odds that? of that? Whoa, I never even thought about that. That's <laughs> wow, that's wild. Nice catch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you said that, and my my alarms went off in my head. I was like, Victory wow. Bell. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, Victory Bells. It's about it's about. I think it's exclusively World War II. I should know more about it. I, I recorded it many years ago. Um, I think it's a cl- exclusively World War II, uh, set in the land of women. So women are all fighting as different uh, different countries, different regions. And I, I play, I play the the Soviet, the Soviet bell. A victory. Yes. A victory. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it, will she be victorious? I, I couldn't tell you. I don't. We hope I don't so. Know. We hope so. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's also one more thing I'm going to throw to you to plug here because sure. people listening to this show, obviously, they're probably huge Pokemon fans or at the very least Nintendo fans. You have some pretty cool memorabilia on your website where like your store has uh, like you can get an autographed Pokemon card from you or <laughs> even a voice acting consultation. How do they pe- sure. how do people find that? Uh, just go to my website, saranatacheni.com. And un- unfortunately, I might I might be taking a break from it because I had an overwhelming amount of things and I'm traveling so much. So it's kind of getting to be a little bit too much right now. Um, but yes, uh, occasionally I'll do a voice acting consultation. It's like half an hour just talking about your career, where you are, why you feel stuck. Usually it's people who are like, I don't know why, why I'm stuck, why I'm not getting things. Um, and so I just ask them about what's your process? How, how do you, how do you, approach sides when you get them for an audition and uh we're able to kind of figure out what they could be doing differently and uh what kind of places they could be targeting based on what they want to do it depends where you are in your career that's basically it so it's just a a short conversation that's what it is awesome well people can go check that out uh hopefully you know it's still up by the time this episode (laughs) airs and they can get an order in before you kind of lock the doors for a little bit yeah um but Sarah, thank you so much for joining this episode of All Things Nintendo. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And thank you so much to everyone for listening. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, throw All Things Nintendo a five-star review and hit that subscribe button. And if you want to get any questions or comments in, you can get in touch with me at allthingsnintendo at gameinformer.com or hit me up on Instagram at Brian P. Shea. And as always, you can join the Game Informer Community Discord, which is a perk for subscribing to our Twitch channel even just for one month. Sarah, where can people find you online? All across social media, I'm at Sarah Natacheni. I'm verified everywhere at Sarah Natacheni1 on YouTube. I messed that up. (laughs) (laughs) That's our show for this week. Thank you again for listening. Take care. We'll see you next time.